Maris, thank you so much for having us. Um, and thank you to McNally Jackson. This is uh, such a pleasure. Um, and a thrill to be with, with both of you with a uh, special, well, I'm equally thrilled to be with, with each of you, but uh, I've made no secret of the fact that I, I uh, see Amanda as one of the, the finest writers in America on any subject, and I'm uh, uh, privileged and humbled to can think of her as a peer. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with the, with the reading, and I'm going, going to defy convention. Uh, which both Amanda and I like to do <laughs> uh, on a regular basis by reading uh, not my book, but from one of Amanda's. And I'm going to just read a short passage, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, this is from Do Not Sell at Any Price, and you can see I've had this for some time, and it's well-worn and read. Uh, and this is a passage about a record collector named Christopher King. And uh, she describes King, quote, having a being prenaturally drawn to narratives of longing and discontent, to performances that sounded unhinged and uncontrollable. It was a preference, unfortunately, she says, that I recognized in myself, a base, possibly shameful desire to hear someone so overcome by emotion that they can no longer maintain any guise of dignity or restraint. Uh, that's what Adrian Geffel is about, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, right. Right. It's yeah. A, right. It's about uh, an an artist uh, who, uh, for you know, reasons actually that are. Um, medical and uh, biological uh, makes music that is uh, unfettered, unrestrained emotional expression, pure emotional expression, unrestrained. And I was fascinated to what would happen if there was someone like that who like could not control the remote, could had no capacity to control their emotions and the music came out as pure emotion. And then what would happen then if she expressed various kinds of emotions and what would people like Amanda and I, what would critics do? How would they confront that? What sense would they make of that? How would the, what would the audience do? What would the record industry, the music industry, the music industry do? Um, I set the book in the world of the avant-garde uh, avant-garde music in the 70s and 80s in New York in the gallery and loft scene. But uh, in some ways it has a lot in common with the world of vernacular music and blues and rural music that Amanda has written about. There's a lot of overlap and I, I hope that the, those of you who, 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 who you know, are, came here for this don't mind uh, if Amanda and I just go like this for the next 45 minutes, because you know, we have a lot of common interests, but don't really know each other. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, David, I will say, first off, uh, I just found the book deeply hysterical. I, I think it's an extraordinary skewering of the way we think and talk about art and artists and the, and the process of art making. Uh, I will say, uh, as a critic, and especially as a critic who got her start writing, you know, somewhat uh, rapturous and extremely purple reviews for The Village Voice, uh, there were moments in here in which in the very best way I felt implicated, personally implicated by some of the critic characters in the book who, who are these sort of without exception, these kind of terrific gas bags. Uh, but to me, it was kind of the most poignant and I thought the, the sharpest uh, sort of satire of that world, of the way in which people, myself included, sometimes get a little bit carried away uh, in, in how we think and talk about art. I do think that is a style of criticism that a lot of writers are kind of beginning to push against now, a sort of way of writing and thinking about music that has historically been kind of centered on the idea of authenticity or the idea of pain or the idea of this sort of unfettered, unmediated emotion is, is, has to be the purest form of expression. Uh, and I think the book is also very smart about the ways in which those ideas are toxic for artists and also for the people who who love music. Uh, and I was hoping you could just talk a little bit in a general way about kind of what made you want to satirize this world and some of these figures. Well, the satire is sharp, but 
also affectionate. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, I, I think the book is kind of a sweet kind of love letter to a time and place and a world. Yeah. And, uh, above all, it's it's a little it's a sweet little love story ultimately, you know, but, but populated by you know a number of characters who are doing difficult things and struggling uh, to do them. So we're witness to their struggle and we experience their struggle, and we see how in some cases they make mistakes that are ridiculous and and comical, but they're not always ill founded, like the. The overwrought, you know, florid, uh, you know, overly emotional language that one of the, the all the critics don't have the same flaws. So I think you're thinking of the critic I named Andy Neve, Andy Neve <laughs> from the Village Voice. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, also, there was a John uh, Gelderman. Am I Gelderman? Yes. Yeah. Here's another flaw. Gelderman sees everything through the prism of himself. So everything he writes about is a kind of self-aggrandization. Yeah. All his criticism is really about himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not a, a, an entirely ill-founded problem because we have to bring ourselves to the work as criticism as critics. But let's get back to N.D. Need for a second. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite critics, Manny Farber, mm -hmm. um, wrote, is a, a painter, as a practitioner, as well as a critic, a film critic, he said that you, as a critic, a critic can never be mimetic enough. Mm -hmm. So the critic could never err in, this, in the name of evoking the feeling of the work in language. You can never be mimetic. And Stanley, the late Stanley Crouch did that. You know, mm -hmm. Stanley Crouch, his language sounded like Charlie Parker, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he utterly evoked Charlie Parker and it's like all oh, excessive overwrought, like, you know, uh, uh, language. So that's what N.D. Neve is trying to do. You know, he's trying to give voice to Adrian Geffel's music, which is wild, you know, crazy, impossible to grasp music for a time. Mm -hmm. it's not all that her music always is. But but he's trying to come to terms with this, so he's making this kind of wild, crazy, impossible to grasp, writing this wild, crazy, impossible to grasp prose that kind of suits it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, one of the, you, you've written about, wait a minute, where is it? It's in another <laughs> one of your books. Oh, here, this is a, a, a oh, actually, you said, I'm not sure there's a way to accurately, accurately recount the experience without sounding dumb or hammy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still struggle with that. I mean, that's a question I ask myself every time I sit down to write. Uh, you know, I think if you're sort of open to the work and the music or whatever it is you're beholding is kind of moving you in a really intense way, yeah, how do you sort of funnel that into language? And I think what you're talking about, hoping that the prose maybe is musical in its own way, uh, is one way of kind of, you know, hoping that it could act as a mirror. But, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, <laughs> I feel like even the things I'm thinking of saying now, I'm uh, preemptively uh, muting myself so that I don't say something embarrassing, but it's a rapturous experience, right? Like, it's not quite like looking at the face of God, but it is intense, I think, when a piece of music really grips and moves you. So how to kind of translate that to something that's going to be useful for a reader, um, that's hard work. And so I did, I empathized and laughed at the critics uh, in your book, because I right. think I, I saw myself in all of them. Right, when he talks about music that's so, like, mind fucking that it comes out of through your body and out of your mouth and around the world and around the whole world and it comes back into your house through the back door and doesn't even knock yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's funny yeah but he's trying to evoke something that right. you know that's that he experienced and they're trying to come to terms with the experience the elusive emotional experience of art and to uh give voice to it and yeah. do justice to it in language is a very difficult thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. you know, so part of what I'm trying to do is confront the difficulty of that through the satire. Right. So, yeah. 
And I will say you do satirize musicians as well as critics in the book. I think one of my favorite parts, I mean, Adrienne herself is kind of conspicu uh, conspicuously and deliberately absent um, from the narrative. So this is the story of her life and work as told through the point of view of the people who were around her or who were adjacent to her in some way. Um, but I will say, I, you know, as someone who writes a lot of magazine profiles of musicians, who spends a lot of time asking musicians to explain their own work, uh, there are times when I have thought, you know, the artist's intention for the work or the artist's way of speaking about the work can, you know, is it relevant? Maybe it's muddying the narrative. Maybe they're not the best kind of stewards of the thing once they make it. Uh, and right. and. I wanted to read a very short passage. Uh, so this is from um, a saxophonist who has collaborated with Adrienne. Uh, and this is very funny. This is him talking about the experience of playing with her. And he says... You share his name? Oh, I can't remember his name. Bobby it's, uh, Alim. I, oh, I can't remember it either. But, <laughs> okay, now I feel better. I was like... <laughs> no, it, uh, Bobby Alim Akbar is his name. God. Perfect. Uh, so he says... We created in the same time and space, if you choose to categorize that as collaboration. I drew inspiration from the truth in her music and I attempted to bring my own truth to the experience. We were united on the plane of emotion. We did not concern ourselves with the technicalities of musical structures or notes. We did not listen to one another in the historical sense. I had awareness that the sound of my instrument appeared to disturb her. This was her truth. My truth was mine. Right. I laughed out loud at that passage because I feel like I've been sitting across from that guy, you know, and he's saying that, you know, talking about some experience of collaborating or, or recording his own music. And I would be nodding along like, yes, that's beautiful. It's so true. It's profound. And then you sort of get home and transcribe the tape. And it's like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> you know? right. uh, this sort of doesn't add up to anything. Right. It sounds foolish. And yet there's something that's not entire, entirely or not precisely foolishness. Yeah. At the heart of it, he's getting at the fact that this is kind of folly to talk, even try to put this in words. You know, we're doing, we're, we're trying to do something that transcends, you know, technique or transcends notes and transcends methods and transcends systems that is human and maybe something more you know that is that is yeah. transcendent and if we get bogged down in the music in the musical obstacle details of it and the details of it we it won't really represent what the experience means to us as artists and, and so it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> it's ridic but there's something there's something there okay. and yeah. all, all the characters um are ridiculous <laughs> no they're not all ridiculous. No, with a but few. I love them, but I also yeah. love them. them too. I mean, the, yeah. the the poor clueless, the the parents who, you know, she comes from Western Pennsylvania, uh, in an area not that far from Ohio and Canada. It's a lot like, you know, the the t territory in this book. <laughs> it's a, you know, her parents run a, a propane business, Geffel Propane, and they're kind of clueless and self-absorbed and we think oh well they're clueless and self-absorbed because they're they're country folk and then we come to new york and, and you know and we meet intellectuals and avant-gardists and successful you know industry people and they're just as clueless and self-absorbed you know yeah. uh, and yeah. so but it's not like everyone is a cartoon in the book they're no, certainly not. And I think there are passages that are incredibly tender um, and really quite moving and, and nearly tragic. I mean, the, the book, I think, is operating on all those levels, and, and that's one of the joys of it. Uh, and I learned a lot about criticism. I mean, it's a, it's a piece of fiction, and I want to talk to you about that, the sort of choice to do this as fiction, because I certainly think you could have written a really interesting kind of nonfiction polemic on this idea, particularly as it pertains to, you know, outsider artists, uh, right. to use that term, which feels like the wrong term, but, right. uh, but yeah, I think it's quite moving, and I found it to be a sort of manual for, I, I would love to assign it to my criticism students as a sort of manual for, here are some of the kind of pitfalls of this work, and here are the moments in which it can become transcendent. Right, uh, right, but why do it in, in, in fiction? Well, if I, if I only want to, 
The book does a number of things, and one of them is explore a set of questions and a set of issues, one of which is, um, and these are the questions that I started with, that really, these are the questions I started like, what if uh, an artist made music that uh, was difficult even for the artist? What if an artist made music that was painful even for, for the artist? Mm. Uh, and then what if the artist's success and acceptance was wrapped up in that difficulty and in that pain? Like what would the consequences of that, of that be? Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there I went to well, how, would the, how would the institutions in the, uh, in the music world, the institutions of presentation, institutions of mediation, universities, critics, uh, you know, the music industry, how would they uh, deal with this? And then uh, what if her success was so locked in to the unpleasantness of the music or the challenge of the, of the music that that unpleasantness, or that difficulty had to be sustained? <laughs> like, like to the detriment of the artist mm -hmm. well, that was one of the questions and then from there i got to well, well then what if she found an escape right and then then what would happen would that whole house of cards fall apart <laughs> so yeah it, it started with the set of questions about the music world but in order to give them form uh, I constructed a set of characters and situation. And then something happened to me that never happened to me before, uh, almost never. And if you could pick up on that almost, I'll, uh, that the characters at a certain point just became real to me. <laughs> you, know, and I, you know, we've read this from fiction, we've read fiction writers say this, it's almost a trope. Mm -hmm. Of, of writing fiction that then the characters almost write the book and the char the characters became real. And there was a point when I, you know, I really knew Adri. I was telling a, a friend of mine today that if we went out on the street and I saw Adrian Barb on the street, I'd say, oh, there's Adrian Barb. Mm -hmm. You know, oh. Yeah, that's it, incredible. It wouldn't, it surprised me. <laughs> You know? Yeah. Well, have you felt a kind of comparable kinship with some of the nonfiction figures you've written about? Well, I spent 11 years living with Billy Strayhorn uh, when I wrote my first book, Lost Life. It was like nine years of research and two years of writing. And he really po uh, occupied my, my life day and night. I, was, I dreamt about him. Yeah. But then there's a hazard in that. Maybe we could, we could talk about this, that I came to feel like I knew him so well, I would know what he thought and felt. And, the, but I can't, I, that's really not possible mm -hmm. of a human being. Mm -hmm. And one has to be careful when writing nonfiction. One has to ma always maintain a set of uh, uh, wall, uh, uh, structures mm -hmm. to prevent one from making sort of unfounded inferences or groundless inferences, or maybe grounded inferences, but uh, you know, not fully grounded inferences of, about somebody. And that was the thing, you know, you, you, I don't really know what Strayhorn would have th thought at any moment. I could come pretty close, mm -hmm. uh, but don't really know. And so here, this, is a, this was a big difference for me uh, in, in writing fiction. I would freed of the, uh, the constraint of, uh, you know, honoring the facts. Mm -hmm. I could honor sort of a set of larger of truths, you know, but not necessarily the facts. Uh, I don't know that that was helpful. But. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Well, I also wanted to ask you as a journalism professor, uh, as someone who teaches in, you know, one of the most esteemed journalism programs in America, uh, how you or your students kind of navigate that sort of odd and murky line between criticism and reporting, um, kind of criticism and the essay, 
reporting in the essay. I don't know, all the places that those sort of ideas and traditions intersect. Uh, yeah. How do you talk about that as a professor? How do your students find a way to sort of make yeah. those things work together? Uh, I just thought of something that I should actually say about the previous question before. Hmm. Yeah, please. Okay. Please. Yeah, of course. Um, that is that I applied some of the methods of my of nonfiction writing to this book. Mm -hmm. That uh, I, nobody, there's no way anybody would know this, but uh, I actually did interviews. So mm -hmm. there's there's um, a state police officer uh, who who gives testimony to an event that took place early in Adri's life, and I don't really know how state police officers talk, so I found a retired state police officer from that area, and I interviewed him, and I gave him, I said, we did an interview, then I said, no, report, tell me, I'm going to call you back, mm -hmm. and then tell me how you would describe this incident mm -hmm. in your language, how would you do that, and we did that, and then there's sections from a neurologist, and I did the same thing with a neurologist, uh, there's, there's several other characters, so I found people like them, mm. and I actually did interviews. Then, uh, Amanda, um, once I had a draft of the book, I hired a director and a set of actors, mm. <laughs> and we performed the whole thing around the table, and I workshopped it like a play. Mm. So I could hear this language, and then, you know, they could also give me input. Was was it all? Did that all feel true to that character? Was that, was there any moment that rang a little false? And so we workshopped it. And then, you know, so you know, I use I use techniques from nonfiction, some techniques from uh, dramatic writing, to do this odd kind of hybrid of a book. Mm, that's extraordinary. That's so cool about the staged reading. So you could really get it because the book is largely in an oral history format. Yeah. I and mean, that was. Well, I wanted I wanted the characters to sound like, even though it's comic, even though it's a satire, and even though I'm always pushing things, and the narrator's me. Yeah. But plus, I mean, he's an even more ridiculous me, you know, <laughs> even more pretentious than I am, which is uh, very hard to imagine. <laughs> but you know, but kind of pushed. Mm -hmm. uh, but even so, I wanted them to sound like real people, like Bobby Akbar, Ali. Well, I mean, speaking of real people, I have a semi-provocative question. Uh, are there musicians about whom you think, you know, the emperor has no clothes? Sort of artists that are widely spread in avant-garde circles, but you, you hear it and you think, wow, this is, you know, terrible nonsense, or this is unlistenable. Uh, and they're sort of pulling a fast one on the entire critical community. Are there any who I feel that is true of? Yeah. No, no, no. I think there, without a doubt, there are artists who are applying a set of, working with a set of values and a set of interests that are different from the values or the interests of you know, certain corners of the, of the audience, without, without a doubt. But I mean, Cecil Taylor, you know, knew exactly what he was doing and worked from nothing but, you know, conviction and, and, uh, and competence. Uh, no, uh, there are artists who I thought have got, have got, allowed themselves to get caught up in kind of gimmickry and poses. Yes, I've written about some people like that. Uh, but I don't think there are, are many. I think more often than not, we're just not equipped to understand uh, you, know, you know, where they're coming from. Uh, and that's one of the great uh, opportunities that music offers us as, as, as critics or as, and, 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 and offers the, the, the listening public, the opportunity to kind of stretch our mind and learn new things and and learn in new ways. But for critics, that opportunity can be a hazard. And uh, a lot of critics, you know, and we both could probably talk about this for hours. In order to be equipped to not only describe work, but to evaluate the work, 
or to make informed judgments about the work, or to write authority about the work. You have to work from a set of values, a set of beliefs about like what's good or what's successful or what works and why. I mean, you have to have a set of you have to have a set of values that you're applying. You do, I do, so you apply. But you also have to be willing to consider other values and to change. Like, I love the piece that you recently wrote about Asia, about mm. Billy Dan. Mm. That was a marvel. And I'm going to teach that. I'm going to no. teach that. Because this is a piece that you would not have written 10 years ago. No, definitely not. Because you've changed. And now you're considering a different set of values. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's very true. I mean, do you think it's important that a critic be able to articulate those values to say sort of this is the criteria I bring to the table when I judge a piece of art? Absolutely, or else don't judge it. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't just yeah. say I like it or I don't like it. It made me happy, it made me, it made me sad. That's just an assertion. It's not mm -hmm. an argument. You have to make an argument that's based on something so that then the reader can make his or her or their own judgments uh, for, you know, make judgments for themselves, but they have to understand the reasons for the argument that you're making so that they're equipped to make uh, a judgment. But could you tell me more about what happened to you between your listening to Asia 10 years ago and now? Sure, yeah. Well, I talk about it a bit in the review, this kind of strange evolution, which for me, I think as a younger person, um, as a younger writer, a younger listener, I really wanted what, what I was writing, what I also wrote about in Do Not Sell at Any Price, which is this uh, sort of feeling of dissolution. You know, I, I subscribed to what I have since come to kind of understand as a very toxic and dangerous idea that like to make good and, and useful and evocative art, a person really needs to sort of slice themselves open, you know, and kind of pull the, pull the flesh apart. And I need to see that sort of big, gross, beating heart, or I think it's bullshit, you know? And it, it, That's what my whole book is about. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, that's why I think on every page, I was like, ah, oh, shit, uh, there I am again. Uh, I felt so seen by it. And I, I think as a, you know, as I sort of evolved as a critic and a human being, I kind of learned like, oh, there is this whole other way to sort of listen to and understand and kind of experience work that is, is more interesting and is sort of less reductive and is kind of less juvenile. And somehow into that space floated Steely Dan <laughs> of all bands, uh, which was a band I hated when I was younger because I thought they were too good. You know, I thought they were too professional. Uh, I thought there was a kind of distance between the musician and the audience that I didn't like. I thought it was, you know, too produced. There were too many things going on. They were too kind of winky. It was too smart. And I didn't want that, you know, like I wanted just someone sort of barfing all over the microphone. Uh, that changed, you know, I evolved and sort of grew and I think came to really understand that work, um, you know, Steely Dan and, and some other bands too, as incredibly beautiful and incredibly sophisticated and in fact quite emotional and, and quite authentic and sort of honest in its own way. Right. Uh, but it's not the obvious sort of gory, like screaming way. It's, it's, a, it's a more subtle and I think more interesting way in many, in many regards. I mean, I mean, hats off to you for having the capacity <laughs> to... to, to not just change, but, but to grow, because, you know, yeah. uh, you know, too many critics are undone by their kind of hidebound adherence to a, a set of values that uh, are limited mm -hmm. uh, or that the times uh, have left behind. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, it is hard, I think, to let you to not get locked into a way of thinking or writing about music uh, to kind of let yourself sort of evolve and, and come to understand things differently. So uh, Adri, yeah. Adri takes the turn where she and I, I don't like and I'm not going to I'm not going to there's some things I can't shouldn't reveal. Yeah. But things change. Mm hmm. You know, things change. And then really problem, then that really complicates things for her, for him, yeah. you know? Yeah, The way that are kind of startling to consider, you know, she's doing something, anyway, blah, 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 anyway. Well, let me ask you, why do you think we want that from our artists? Because I do, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, but I do feel like there is a kind of collective desire 
uh, for work that feels real, for work that feels born of some kind of intense screaming yeah. anguish or sorrow or, or even joy, I guess, ecstasy, any of these kind of extreme outlier emotions. We want that in our art. That's what we think makes art vibrant. Yeah. I mean, why that? Why, why is that sort of the uh, standard so many of us have? Well, I think you're talking about two different things. You're talking about one, the uh, credence that we give uh, veracity uh, or or authenticity, and uh, that's sound. You know, we don't don't want uh, as a not that we don't want. We recognize that there's value in the uh, in work that uh, uh, emerges organically from someone's experience. Not that, not not though that pure performativity and artifice, you know, doesn't have value as well as a different thing. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. Bowie and, right. yeah. you, know, you know, disco was just as great as punk, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I was a punk at the time, but now I listen and say, whoa, I missed a lot of what was going on, you know. all yeah. the, There was a lot to that theatricality and that artifice and that show and also in that yeah. polish and all that gloss and it's, it, there's a lot to that that I just missed so yeah. authenticity yeah but we tend to uh, rec recognize it only mm -hmm. in certain emotions and we deny the authenticity of other sets kinds of emotions right. so you know right like you you said even joy yeah <laughs> Right, even joy. It's like, you know, we'll recognize it in cries of anguish, you know, and discontent and rage. Oh, that's authentic. But what if someone is authentically happy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Authentically content, or what if somebody right. that is that not authentic? Right. Of course. I mean, of course it is. But I feel like this is an anxiety that also affects artists. I think artists sort of worry about that. I mean, I've certainly had many conversations with musicians where they, you know, they get married and they have a kid and their life's pretty good and they've got a bit of money. And, you know, it's like, oh, now I have a Subaru and like, what am I going to write songs about? You know, there's this fear that uh, that I think is nurtured by the culture that great art kind of comes from an extreme experience or it right. comes from trauma or it comes from some outsized emotion uh that it's really hard to sort of write through contentment or to write through I, happiness or to write through a day that's like just pretty nice i think that's imposed by the culture you know and really to the detriment of the art and i think if, if you could if you just confront the satisfactions that you derive from child rearing or from the family the way that john lennon did in his yeah. last years yeah yeah god that's beautiful work you yeah. know it's been, he kind of became a little more like Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was gonna say McCartney. Like McCartney's Ram has to be one of the best yeah. records about being uh, pretty happy uh, uh, ever made. You know, and you know when and when Paul, you know, adopts you know rage and tries to it sounds <laughs> fake. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It feels it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what? You know, there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a wide range. The emotional spectrum has many colors, yeah. and they're all, you know, legitimate for art. But we do, but we do somehow in this culture, we ascribe more authenticity and value to, you know, to severity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And aggression. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. And and the canons get sort of written that way. The history gets written that way, which is something I talk about a bit in, in uh, the book that I wrote about 78 collectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these guys that are sort of marginalized or kind of on the edge of things and drawn to this music that sort of expresses a similar feeling. Uh, so ultimately, that's the music that gets sort of collected and, and survives. Um, but there were many, you know, records about happier times. <laughs> right. And there were 10 years of blues records before those records in the late 20s and 30s that they're collecting, that they're ignoring because they yeah. were made with jazz instrumentation and sung by women. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other three I, hours of conversation. Yeah. But. <laughs> uh, so David, I wanna um, invite people to start leaving some questions uh, in the chat about criticism or music or um, you know David's work about this book in particular. Uh, and before we do that or as people kind of enter their questions into the chat, I was hoping maybe you could give us a, a brief reading. Okay, I'm gonna, um, Adrian Geffel, it would not be too revealing 
too, it would be not too much to re reveal to explain that we learn uh, after a few chapters that the reason for her odd behavior is that she's afflicted by an exotic neurological disorder called psychosynesthesia. Don't look it up, I made it up. Uh, in which, <laughs> there's many invented terms in this I, book, I, by I, the way. Absolutely for this. Made up. So, there's a whole, anyway, you won't believe it. Anyway, it's pretty credible. But so she hears music in her mind all the time that corresponds to her emotions. So she finds a way to channel that at the, at the piano. So she's making music that's your pure, unmediated emotional expression. Uh, she comes to New York and becomes a phenomenon in the gallery and loft scene in the late 1970s and 80s, making this very free, wild music and uh, befriends a woman who she meets under psychiatric care who uh, has been get, who's a painter uh, named Anathema. She's been given that name by a gallerist named Armut, who changed his name to be like Armut from Duchamp. Okay. So this is uh, an early section of testimony by Anne Athema. The book takes the form of oral history, where it's all testimony from the witnesses of the Adrian Geffel's life. And this is a brief passage of testimony by Anne Athema describing Adrian's early days in the gallery scene. She says, Armit, because he changed his name, thought I should change my name too. Armit thought everyone should find a new name and become a new person. He would say, in the future, everybody is going to change their identity every 15 minutes. I said, I see, and now you're Andy Warhol. In 15 minutes, could you please become someone more original? Armit came up with the name Anathema for me, like Anathema. Get it? Hardy har har har. Uh, Armit was the great avant-garde punster. There was a fellow named Bob Sheff around then. He was a Texan and he played piano in a bar band. Armit renamed him Gene Tyranny, T-Y-R-A-N-N-Y, and he became a thing. Armit was trying to find someone to call Kurt Vile, V-I-L-E, but no one went along with it because they didn't get the reference. Years later, I saw that a singer was going by the name Kurt Vile, but it turned out that Kurt Vile was the guy's real name. Armit was furious. I liked becoming anathema, actually. It was ludicrous. I thought of going with Irma Nudica, but Arm Armit was working with a drag artist. He was grooming to call Irma Ladouche, so Irma was taken. Working in public under the guise of anathema allowed me to function without creative pressure, protected by the armor of irony. Geffel was a different creature entirely. I was a nest of insecurities and anxieties, hiding behind a joke name, making joke art. Geffel was pure truth and openness. Her, mu um, her emotions were her music, and her music was absolute emotion. I never experienced anything like that. We arranged for Geffel to play at the opening of my show at K. Lewitt. That's the K. Lewitt Gallery. I made, made that up. Uh, and uh, she ended up playing at... I have to point that out because gene tyranny is real and so is Kurt Vile. So like real people and fiction. Yeah. Uh, Philip Glass appears in the book, but he's a plumber and he fixes their toilet, which he really was. And in his memoir, he devotes three pages to how the proper way to repair a toilet. So it was really important to him. And so yeah, that's in the book. So anyway, so uh, I, she ended up playing at the gallery every night for a month or, or more, I believe. I thought it would be a good fit because the whole idea of art and music then was to do things that didn't fit together. Mm. Trisha Brown was walking up the side of a building in an alley down the street. Larry Rivers was painting while he was playing the saxophone, making a plaster cast of his dick at the same time. No, if you want to know, I wasn't there to see that, luckily. But I do know people who have seen the plaster cast, and a lot more who have seen the dick. I told the gallery I wanted no canvases on the walls. I would describe the art, and that would be the art. The gallery people were ecstatic in the diffident 
an alienating way gallery people experience ecstasy. And I saved a lot of money on canvases. Before the doors opened, Geffel paced around the gallery, looking over the empty walls, humming to herself. She said to me, I hope you know Kashka, that's uh, Anne Anthem's real name. I can't promise to match the spirit of your artwork. I said, I know Geffel, I've heard you play. That's why you're here. She made that odd little smile of hers and she said, hey Kashka, thanks. The opening of the show was fairly well attended. There were 20 or 25 people there. All the people who went to every opening to ogle one another and be seen by one another. The gallery, uh, the director of the gallery introduced me and I walked slowly all around the room and pointed to empty spaces on the walls. I said, this is one of the earliest pieces in the series. It is the secret of life, pretending to be the secret of death. I gazed at the wall for a moment. I walked a few feet and I said, this is the earliest childhood memories of everyone here tonight, superimposed over the worst fears of everyone coming here tomorrow. When I had covered all the wall space, I thanked people for coming and told them to enjoy the art while they listened to the music of an important new composer. I introduced Geffel and she started playing a little electric piano the gallery rented from Steve Reich. Within a few minutes, everybody in the gallery had gathered around her, watching her and listening intently. Geffel was terribly nervous and that only made the music more like Geffel's music. Thanks. That was beautiful. I love that passage. It's oh, thanks. I mean, it's funny, but it's also uh, just incredibly moving, which I think is, is something you do so masterfully in the book. That it's sort of walking this razor's edge between satire and also what feels to me, a, you know, a kind of earnest, as you were saying, a love letter to criticism and the avant-garde and music and, and New York and, all, you know, all of these things. When I think about it, it's the little love story that I think most fondly about, and I really can't, I don't think I should say anything about that. No, no I know, I don't want to give well, it away. I don't think about that, but that's my favorite part of the book. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great part of the book, and I think incredibly relatable. Um, so I have a question, uh, okay, we have a couple questions. So this is uh, a question that um, Peter sent to me privately in the chat, which maybe meant it was meant just for me, but I wanna talk about it with you. Uh, are you ready? I mean, we're talking about sort of fact and fiction and mythology. Uh, so maybe this is a good time to talk about Bob Dylan, someone we have both uh, written about at various times. Uh, so Peter was asking me in advance of um, a review that I wrote about the new Dylan record. Um, for the that new was record. great. Oh, well, thank you. Really, uh, I actually didn't write about it after you did. Uh, <laughs> I do. It's okay. Well, there's no point. Ah, uh, come on. Uh, <laughs> you saved me a couple of days of work. <laughs> well, Peter asked how extensive was your Dylan knowledge beforehand and, and how much research sort of had to go into that. Oh, no. Uh, well, and that's an interesting question because I think with someone like Dylan, uh, there's obviously an advantage to having a kind of body of knowledge of, of the work to draw from. But I also think there's probably an advantage of coming to that work with fresh ears. So, so for me, I've been a lifelong Dylan fan. I have read your incredible book, Positively Fourth Street, uh, which talks quite a bit about um, Dylan's kind of early life in New York. Uh, so I feel like there was a lot of sort of baggage I brought into that as a listener. And I almost wish I could kind of hear some of these records with fresh ears. Is that, is that something you think about, especially with someone like Dylan, where the body of literature on him is vast? Huge, huge challenge. I mean, I won't write about anything until I feel that I'm qualified to write about it, which means mm -hmm. I, I can write about it with some authority, which means I'm deeply steeped in it. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it, I've confronted it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've felt it and I've thought about it, you know, I've thought about it. So I won't write about anything until that, until I reach that point. So with, with Dylan, I mean, the first album I bought was, was a Believe It or Not, a Strangely Self-Portrait. Mm. It just happened to come out when I was 14, and that's, you know. <laughs> what a wild way into that discography. That's pretty cool. So, I didn't know that. It was a weird, anyway. Yeah. So, no, but Dylan was part of my, I, in college, I wrote about Dylan. I wrote college papers about Dylan. I wrote a mm. screenplay about Dylan. You know, and you just, if, 
my age, you can't escape Bob Dylan, and I have mm. no interest in him doing so. I was deeply, deeply absorbed in his work and what it meant my whole life. So mm. I came to a book with all that, but then, you know, made a study for years of the time and place. I did hundreds of interviews and interviewed uh, everybody I could, uh, mm -hmm. like I said, hundreds of people. So, you know, then I built on that knowledge I had, but you're absolutely right that it's very difficult to come to the music with fresh ears. I mean, if I ever had to write about, I won't write about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. so, like, like what is there to say, <laughs> you know? And also <laughs> I can't hear it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there must be some critical sweet spot where you kind of know enough to have some expertise or authority, uh, but not so much that you have a foregone kind of conclusion about what the work means or what it can do. Uh, and it's very hard to stay in that sweet spot with some of these artists. The Beatles are a great example. Right. You know, I'll, I'll write about them again when I do f f feel that I have something to say that's fresh, that's worth saying. Yeah, right. Because you've got a thousand other sort of voices in the right. mix. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm more interested, man, like you, in finding new things to write about and new kinds of music that I haven't written about, yeah. and to consider different sets of standards the way that you are with with uh, with, with Steely Dan. Now, I mean, mm -hmm. so I'm I'd always, I'm more interested in finding. I'm interested in this avant-garde writer and uh, composer named Sarah Kirkland Snyder right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know her. Like, yeah. you know, she's fairly new to me, mm -hmm. but brilliant. And so I found myself gravitating in the in recent years a little more to the new music world mm -hmm. because it's a whole you know, it's a body of work and, and a, a whole world of music that I didn't really know that much. It, it's an opportunity for me to learn. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of intellectual avarice that you know, like I get to learn something new. Yeah, which is one of the great pleasures of doing this work. I mean, it is sort of that, right? I mean, when you're a journalist or a reporter or a critic, that, that's kind of the job, right? Being curious about something and then getting to learn as much as you can about it and, and then being sort of forced to reckon with it on the page. I think it's a, certainly a privilege. Um, okay, we have a question from Diego uh, who asks, when Flaubert wrote Madame Bovary, so many identified with the story and thought it based on them that the author had to say, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. How many in the world you describe will feel the shoe fits and how much of you has in fact filtered into the invented subject of study? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, well, de Kooning said about painting that every painting uh, is a face and usually the face of the artist. Mm. So there's a kind of self portraiture in you know, in all art, it's just some, to some degree. Mm -hmm. So there's a little of me in all the characters, mm -hmm. but no one character in this book is based on any specific. It's not like, oh, you know, that's, uh, I don't know, uh, Amanda, <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> Lester, that's Lester Bangs, right. you know. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's it's a, it's imagined, but you know grounded in reality. That, it's, 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 I don't know if that answers Diego's questions, but I know who he is. So if it's an inadequate <laughs> answer, you can email me. Um, well, I would say as a reader, David, I think. Um, like I said, I sort of felt implicated in a kind of joyful and um, and funny way as a critic. And I would imagine as an experimental musician in New York, especially one who was active in the 70s, you would read this and just go, oh my God, it's me, c'est moi. You know, it would be that same experience of, uh, but I think again, that's one of the kind of joys of the book because it is yeah. lovingly, um, lovingly written. Uh, well, you know, the me in the book is kind of foolish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the you in the book, I mean, this is sort of uh, when reading the rereading the introduction after finishing the whole book, um, I found it kind of funny again that the uh, the narrator of the thing is like, I don't know her. I've never seen her perform. There's sort of all this projection. Uh, it's kind of a fantasy. You know, there's a lot going on there, too, in terms of, you know, again, how kind of critics interact with the work that they dissect. I love that you just said the narrator of the book. I don't know her. Yeah. <laughs> 
I love that because when I had the had to choose a reader for the audio version, I saw it has to be a woman. It has oh, to be, amazing! It has to be a woman because it's like it really is a kind of a woman's book. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the a lot of what you're skewering, and I want to make sure we get to Audrey's question before we run out of time. Uh, but I think a lot of what you're skewering is the kind of male critical voice. I mean, very much so. Uh, it's a kind of fixation on certain things and a disregard of um, right. you know, certain emotional resonances and other right. things. It felt overwhelmingly male, what, what you were lampooning. Right. No. Um, so Audrey asks, this is also um, a lovely question, and I'll be very curious to hear your answer. Uh, are you nostalgic right now for any particular years in New York, and do you miss live jazz terribly? And I what? Do I what jazz and you Do you miss live jazz terribly? Oh, oh. Terri terribly, terribly. I mean, there some clubs are are streaming live from the clubs. The Vanguard has been has been doing that, uh, and some uh, other venues have been doing that outside of New York. But I miss it. So it's live, you know. It's someone's there making the music spontaneously. But the interaction between the audience and the musician is missing, and that's like a driving element in uh, improvised music, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so in jazz, the, the performance of jazz is a, is a duet with the audience uh, and the musician. You know, the, the, the audience is, the musician is feeling the audience and responding to, to the audience. And not always, but to a significant degree, often. Mm -hmm. uh, in Miles Davis, could turn his back on the audience and be indifferent to the audience. That's part of what he was doing. That's legitimate too. Yeah. But there's a kind of interaction with the audience that informs most jazz and I miss it terribly. Am I nostalgic for a particular era? I'm not really a sentimental uh, person. So I'd have to say, no, not really. Uh, no, mm. no I'm, I'm, I most miss, the present. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect answer to that question. I think we all do. Yeah. I can't wait for the present to be over. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was interesting what you were saying, too, about um, the way that an audience kind of affects, uh, you know, musician performing on stage. I also think there's something that kind of affects us as listeners when we have sort of made the choice to, like, get up and put on our coats and, you know, take the train to a venue and sort of sit down and order a martini or, you know, whatever the, this is a very civilized experience I'm describing. Sometimes it's more gross than that, but right. you know, there's something about that kind of commitment too, that changes the way I hear music when you sort of really actively show up for something and you think, okay, I'm right. here for a few hours and, and this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Right. Um, that's really different from listening to a live stream or recording at home or any kind of approximation of that experience. Um, and I miss that. I miss what I feel like changes in my body when I mm -hmm. put in the effort and, and make the choice and sort of go to hear someone perform. Mm -hmm. um, I, I listen a little bit differently under those circumstances, and it's really hard to recreate that now. So, I've been playing more because I'm an amateur musician. I'm not good. I, make, I do not pretend to be good. I never have. Uh, and I'm enjoying that. Mm -hmm. But... To me, there's a kind of a uh, it's kind of a dissonance in that I enjoy the experience, but uh, tragically, I could also hear myself. So, <laughs> you know, right, so, yeah, you know, I enjoy the making of the sounds, but I, but I loathe the hearing of the sounds. Yeah, so, <laughs> I feel that way about writing. I enjoy the sort of clacking sentences, but good lord, um, it's hard to read them back sometimes. Really? Yes. I, your sentences are fabulous. Oh, well, that's very it was 80% eyewear. Um, <laughs> eyeglasses, I guess you said. And um, he looked about 10,000 years old. Yeah. <laughs> now, yes, I haven't very... read that in five years, but like, it's, that's really good. You know, that's, oh. It's making really good sentences. That's very kind, David. Thank you. Um, and likewise, and I think we are just out rounding out the hour here. Um, so I just want to thank you again so much for uh, letting me be a part of this book launch and this event and, uh, and all of this. I loved the book. I think it's one of the smartest things I've read on critics and criticism. And 
and music and the avant-garde and art making and all of it. Um, so this was such a pleasure. So thank you. Um, thank you, Maris. Thank you, McNally Jackson. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. It was oh. so nice to see your virtual. Everybody see Jill Sobiel there? Oh, no. She's there. Jill? Can everybody see her? I, <laughs> I see her. Why can only I see her? <laughs> oh, I see her. Hey, Jill. Maris, <laughs> is there a way for other people to see Jill there? They, I think if they put... Jill, if you take, turn your uh, mic off? On gallery view rather than yeah, speaker you, view. You have to I'm off. Your... So that's Jill. Jill, Jill is... is this was a this was swell. This I, I had a good time. <laughs> Jill, of course, is, course the is the composer of one, uh, one, one of the one of the great tributes to Adrian Gaffel, Adrian a Dream. Mm -hmm. Right, Jill. It's so inspiring. <laughs> it was so great. I love the book. I do love the book. So. Oh well, thanks, Jill. And I love the love story in it, which you guys haven't talked about. I know we did really barely talk about that. I felt like I was just trying. Like, to you guys just talked talk about, about you guys just talked about your critic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. There is a very sweet love story in the book that we mostly ignore. Okay, we're dangling it as a cat. I mean, yeah. thank you for doing it. It's really a privilege to and an honor to do this with you. And thanks for all the kind words and the, the, and the, and the great work that you know you give us all. And I uh, can't wait to read whatever it is you're writing next. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you wow. all. And thank you to this wonderful audience. And please buy some books. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> all right, good night, everybody. Good night.